and welcome to Good News. I tell you what, it doesn't take much to impress reporters these days. Plates, they are pretty awesome. <laughs> Over at BBC Breakfast, an important sex tip. Never put anything larger than an elbow in an orifice. <laughs> I've always said that. <laughs> now, with all the news focusing on Japan and Libya, things have been a bit quiet in Scotland. A dozen ambulances were sent to an accident in Fife earlier today that resulted in a 12-year-old boy having a plaster put on his finger. <laughs> Did anyone else see that old bloke talking about verjazzling? If it's groomed and quite smart, then it can be quite, uh, you know, enhancing. But if it's a mess, you know, you think, yuck. <laughs> you know, what's it got inside there? <laughs> In political news this week, the English Defence League held a march in Blackburn. Here's what happened. They arrived in Blackburn by the bus load. <laughs> Members of the English Defence League from across the country voicing their opposition to Islamic extremism. Can some of you please behave yourselves? In case you don't know who the English Defence League are... Hello, sir, and why are you here today? I'm here to protest, right? So I'm going on a march because I want Britain to be back British. I want Britain to be back British. We've got interracial law and the Muslimic infidel. That's how we get their law over our country. Some of these Burka people, right? They can't even speak proper England. <laughs> We're trying to put the Iraqi law down on, on, on London. We're trying to put... They're just trying to put their, their law down on us, and we, we can't stand for that. Which Iraqi law is this? It's the Muslim, Muslimic law. It's the Muslim, Muslimic law, right? Shut right, they want to do a 9-11 every Wednesday, right? They want to stop me eating bacon. Their leader, right, Al-Qaeda, you know, the bloke who lives in a cave, right? He wants Sharon Law. Well, I don't want a woman forcing me to speak mosque. <laughs> Check out their leader, Stephen Lennon. We will not say what you want. We will not do what you want. I have not been groomed in public speaking. I have not been educated. I've never read a book! <laughs> even know how to use a spoon! <laughs> what a role model. Now, the thing that caught my eye about this story, they went to Blackburn because they wanted to fight an anti-fascist group. It didn't really work out that way. They seemed determined to fight someone, and because they couldn't get to the other demonstration, they just <laughs> fought one another. Brilliant, isn't it? The racists started fighting themselves. <laughs> Boy, Terry, you've given me a black eye. Now I hate my own eye. <laughs> surprised if one of them started a fight with his own shadow. Stop following me! <laughs> Stop it, you black bastards! <laughs> They're the kind of people who hold up signs that say, ban the burka, whilst dressed like this. <laughs> Over in Italy, the Prime Minister Silvio Sex Pest Berlusconi <laughs> is going to court. The Italian Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi, has been ordered to stand trial on charges of paying for sex with an underage girl. Prosecutors allege Berlusconi paid for sex with the 17-year-old Moroccan girl, nicknamed Ruby. So, is Berlusconi worried? Well, clearly not. He laughed off the scandal by saying this. According to a survey, when asked if they'd like to have sex with me, 30% of women said yes. <laughs> The other 70% replied, what? Again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sleazy bastard. <laughs> Probably the most ridiculous development of the trial is this. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's called up George Clooney as one of his defence witnesses for when he goes on trial next month. Makes sense, the two are inseparable. I mean, you barely see them apart. George Clooney says he only recalls meeting the Italian Prime Minister once. Berlusconi <laughs> is clearly bullshitting. Yeah, Clooney was there, Ian Holloway, uh, the blue one from Avatar. <laughs> oh, and the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. No, this guy. <laughs> Elsewhere in the world of politics, have you heard the latest news about the Liberals? 
A company in Suffolk have planned a musical about <laughs> Nick Clegg. <laughs> Apparently they're going to call it Clegg the Musical. Surely they should have gone for Nick and his amazing Technicolor bullshit. <laughs> I was so excited by this, I couldn't wait. So, I've decided to write my own version. Last year, Britain loved me more than Charlie Sheen loves pills. Winning. And now I'm more unpopular than bloody Heather Mills. <laughs> Pensioners despise me, I'm shafted by the press. He never should have gobbled David Cameron's eaten mess. I said I'd save the NHS, he was talking shit. My promises were just as fake as Katie Price's tits. I'm just a Tory poodle pumping George and David's legs. It's bollocks being liberal when your name is Nick Clegg. There's been some ghoulish goings on in the West Midlands. A cupboard door mysteriously opens of its own accord. Is someone behind it playing tricks? Not so, according to a family in Coventry who claims something is haunting their home. There's a ghost in Coventry? <laughs> Look what he's been doing. The room is quiet and motionless. But then, suddenly, disturbed by a moving pink chair. <laughs> is this family being visited by a poltergeist? No. <laughs> Someone's moving a chair with string. Either that or you've got a ghost that's into feng shui. <laughs> He's hardly scary. A moving pink chair coming out of the closet. I bet that ghost doesn't go, whoa. He goes, ooh. <laughs> Mind you, it isn't just the chair. Look what else this evil spirit has done. The light came on, or it switched off one or the other, and we went to the kitchen to try and um, turn the light back off. I think it must have turned it back on. Um, and as we touched the kitchen light, all you heard was a bang and the whole house electrics had gone off. That's a power cut. <laughs> Unbelievably, this isn't the only ghost story from Coventry. There was another one in the news this week, but he doesn't move furniture. He's got a bit of a temper. Woman in Coventry claims she's been beaten up for seven months <laughs> by thug ghosts. Casper's gone bad! <laughs> I know we shouldn't laugh, but look where she claims the ghosts are stalking her. I can't even escape them when I leave the house. They pester me at Asda. <laughs> the ghosts follow her to Asda. It's like something out of a chat magazine. I reached in the freezer, suddenly I were cold all over. <laughs> then a voice from nowhere went, Supervisor to check out three, please. <laughs> I looked around, no one there. Ghosts. <laughs> what I want to know, why is a ghost attacking a woman from Coventry? Surely, if you can punch anyone, you choose this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and why be so violent? If I was an invisible ghost, I wouldn't hit people, I'd have some fun. First thing I'd do, I'd go to a zoo, I'd pick up a penguin, and I'd make him look like he was flying. <laughs> Just to see all the other penguins go, what the f? <laughs> How are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle! <laughs> Let's be honest, a violent ghost would be terrifying, but it would definitely have improved this film. Nothing quite like a lady getting hit. <laughs> Elsewhere in the news, scientists have finally discovered the secret of love. A 21st century matchmaker promises singles they can find someone compatible simply by matching their faces to others. This is the news that apparently you're attracted to people that look like you. Shit. <laughs> that doesn't bode well for me. <laughs> My girlfriend actually calls me Shirley. <laughs> but that's another story. 
<laughs> if the scientists are right, it explains why these two are so close. <laughs> Let's be honest, it's bollocks. I don't want to go out with someone that looks like me. I've got a lazy eye. We'd spend eternity <laughs> unable to make eye contact. <laughs> Our children would look like this. <laughs> if I banged an animal. <laughs>The big sports story of the week had to be this. The Football Association has upheld Wayne Rooney's two-match ban for swearing into a TV camera. Nobody cares. A footballer <laughs> swore? Next you'll be telling me Jordan isn't a virgin. <laughs> what do they expect? It's Rooney. He's hardly going to turn into Stephen Fry after scoring. Lad, he got the ball here. Come on, lad, you can do it. There you go, it's a goal! My goodness. That ball flew into the net like a glorious falcon. <laughs> Look to me, chaps, for my foot is more powerful than Thor's hammer. <laughs> Let's finish these rapscallions off and head back to mine for jam sandwiches and ginger beer. <laughs> Are you all right, Wayne? I don't know, I just came over a bit weird when I scored that fucking goal. <laughs> you get all these hysterical parents. He swore! Now the children will swear! Calm down! They haven't copied him in the past. Where are you going? Mother, I'm off a granny banging. <laughs> If it's good enough for Rooney, it's good enough for me. <laughs> now fetch my Shrek mask. <laughs> that isn't the only football story this week. Look what Mohamed al Fayed has done. As Fulham football fans arrived at the front of Craven Cottage Stadium on Sunday for a league match, a controversial statue of the pop legend Michael Jackson was being unveiled at the back. Have you seen it? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like something you get with a Happy Meal. <laughs> Obviously, the fans hate it. Cue excellent reaction from Al Fayed. If some uh, stupid fans don't understand and appreciate such a gift this guy gives to the world, you know, they can just go to hell. It's <laughs> a bit harsh. Had you been in hell, stood next to some bloke? What are you here for? I ain't a baby. <laughs> you? I didn't like a statue. <laughs> I thought he looked like goat's cheese over a sex doll. <laughs> Fulham must be the least family-friendly club in the league. They're called the Cottagers, and now they've got a statue of a suspected pedo. <laughs> what does their mascot look like? This? <laughs> Some peculiar news from around the globe. Let's start with a very strange new law in Malawi. Farting in public is apparently such a big problem in Malawi, officials want it to be made a criminal offence. <laughs> we can't allow that. We all fart. Where do you think we could go and fart? That is no issue to debate upon. Exactly. You can't ban farting. Sometimes you can't help it. If my dad lifts something heavy, he'll guff like a fat horse. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is going to change the comic relief videos. Just £5 a month can help Bawembe go to Europe so he can drop his guts. <laughs> Just loads of blokes hanging their ass over the border. Ah! <laughs> Thanks, Lenny Henry. <laughs> As you can imagine, the people of Malawi are not taking this sitting down. We all fart in public and it'll be difficult to tell who's done it. Some do it silently. In some cases, it's like tear gas which goes shh. <laughs> if my ass made that noise, I'd be down the library freaking people out. <laughs> That librarian keeps telling me to be quiet, and he fucking stinks. <laughs> From Malawi to Australia, and a novel way to boost the population. Two of Australia's biggest IVF clinics have launched an online advertising campaign to encourage more men to become sperm donors. They've done so in typically Aussie fashion. Sperm donation, more fun than giving blood. <laughs> I love the fact you can only see one of his hands. <laughs> Have you been to Australia? All their ads are like that, ridiculously bland. Socks, your ankles, fucking love them. <laughs> McDonald's, do da da da, eat it, you dick. <laughs> I bet you money the blood bank hit back. Give blood, <laughs> don't be a wanker. <laughs> hey, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Staying, <laughs> staying down under. Here's a headline I never thought I'd see. 
Man drives with parrot on windscreen. <laughs> a bloke from Melbourne has been attaching a parrot to his windscreen wipers and taking him for a drive. <laughs> Do you want to see the parrot in action? <laughs> One of the videos was shot in a Melbourne back street. Hey, go Angus! <laughs> Good boy, mate. I love it out here. <laughs> the wind blowing through my feathers. You know, I don't think I've ever been happier. Another, this one, at around 100 kilometres an hour in the breakdown lane of a busy Melbourne freeway. Who's a pretty boy then? Not me, I've got flies in me teeth. <laughs> Beak, not teeth. I haven't actually, uh, haven't actually got any teeth. Um, <laughs> I'm a parrot. <laughs> I'll do the next joke if I were you, Rush. You look like a dick on national telly. The bloke is an absolute moron. Look what he gets angry about. I'm sick of people looking at me and laughing as I'm driving down the street. Well, don't sell a tape of parrot to your car then. <laughs> As you can imagine, the authorities want this to stop. And you're telling people it'll stop? No, I'm not going to say it's going to stop. I'm going to think about it. Yeah, I'm going to think about it. But then, in fairness, I said I'd think about going to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, the parish should count himself lucky. There are worse cars to be attached to. It's Time for the mystery guest, and yes, you're right, I did get beaten up by an old lady last week. Ah. <laughs> this is the part of the show I genuinely don't know anything about. There's going to be a mystery guest who's been in the news, and I have to figure out who that person is. So, please welcome my mystery guest! <laughs> Hello, nice hello. to meet you. I'm Rice. I'm Jamie. Jamie. Yes, hello. Nice to meet you, Jamie. Hello. Sweet. Please tell me your surname's Dodger. And we'll get on. <laughs> I'm guessing scientist. You're wrong. I'm wrong? Yeah. Why, why have you got all this stuff then? Uh, I was given it. You were given it? By them. By them? Yes. This isn't your stuff? No, all this is my stuff. Yeah. This isn't fair, so they've dressed you up to look like a scientist. What do you do? Are you a matador or something like that? <laughs> it's, it's got something to do with potions, clearly. Yeah. Uh, do you make potions? Not potions, no. Okay, uh, but I'm close. Close. Yes. Where do you make um, perfume? Do you make perfume? perfume? Do you make perfume? I made perfume. Yeah. What's your scent? Um, it's Are you Calvin Klein? No. <laughs> that would have been great, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you make perfume. Is that yeah. why you um, why you've been in the news this week? Yes, it is. Yeah. For I mean, making perfume. Yeah. A perfume called Surplus or Surplus. It's called Surplus or Surplus if you're French. Surplus. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, it's made from the excesses of the body. It's made from the excesses of the body? Yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> doesn't sound like a massive seller. Um, <laughs> what, so what are you telling me? You make poo perfume? Yeah. You do? You make poo? Yeah. Well, it's not just from... It's not just from poo? No, it's also from urine and hair. Oh, I apologise. <laughs> so it's poo perfume and wee and, and mm -hmm. hair? Mm -hmm. Do you want to try it? No. No? <laughs> but, um... Uh, you know, I've got a selection of people here who'd like. <laughs> oh, I'll sniff it, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, okay, oh, right. So... <laughs> it smells all right, actually. It doesn't really smell like... <laughs> I need someone to verify that it doesn't smell like. Oh, you're up for it. <laughs> yeah, do you want a fancy bit of poo? Yeah. <laughs> Give us a whiff and shout out what that smells like, madam. It smells like That's you're now. <laughs> That would be... That would be the best advert for perfume, wouldn't it? You know, normally it's some sexy French model or something like that. It's just your nan going, I stink. <laughs> so, how much poo does it take to make uh, one pot of this? Um, I made, in total, I made about seven litres of liquid. Yeah. Um, but that's including... Do you of... live alone? Um, <laughs> was, I'm guessing that was... Yeah, yeah but... at the time I was. My girlfriend was in New York. She was in New York? Yeah. Did you have any idea that you were doing this? Uh, no. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing? Nothing, this and that. 
Uh, yeah. Explain to me the process from poo to perfume. How does that happen? <laughs> because, you know, that doesn't yeah. look or smell like poo. Yeah. Well, um, so how does it happen? Like, the, the simplest way of kind of putting them together would be yeah. that um, in faeces there is a molecule called scatol, which is the smell um, molecule. And it's the same molecule that makes white flowers smell. It's like orange blossoms, junipers, jasmines. Like, it's just a different percentage. So in faeces it's like 30%, and in white flowers it's around about 5 So I just, I extracted that through a steam distillation process, which is the traditional method of extracting oils and essential oils from any material. And then diluted it down into a uh, more pleasant smell rather than a... How did you learn all this? I had research and speaking to perfumers and scientists and then experimenting with nose pegs. Um, yeah. Flipping heck, man. <laughs> I think we need a bit of help. I like you. <laughs> but that is... You know, isn't it interesting? Because you're wearing a white coat and you have glasses, yeah. you have an air of intelligence about you, right? And we go, oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you would have said that to me on a park bench, right? <laughs> Away, but now yeah. I'm going, oh, how very clever. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Thank you. Well, lovely to meet you. What a bizarre thing. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give up for my mystery girl. Yeah. Now, remember last week we found the house that looked like Hitler? Well, get ready for this. Face of Elvis found on bug in Singapore <laughs> forest. <laughs> they found an insect that looks like Elvis, and when you see it, it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> Truly remarkable. It's like he's in the room. <laughs> in fairness, most insects look like people. Some look like sportsmen. <laughs> some look like rappers. <laughs> and some look like evil dictators. <laughs> uh, this next story is great. Here's a sentence you don't hear very often. Now, fireman from Hull is being described as a hero after giving the kiss of life to a pet dog. <laughs> hero? <laughs> Imagine him with the other firemen. Just put out a fire, you? I tongued a Labrador. <laughs> Did you see how long he worked on the dog? It was such a rewarding thing to see, the way the fireman was... It must have been about 30 minutes working on the dog. <laughs> 30 minutes, it were beautiful. I mean, the dog came round after two, but he wanted to be sure. <laughs> he was so dedicated. I mean, it was 20 minutes before we told him he'd got the wrong end. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite part of the report has to be the reaction of the dog's owner. I don't think I could have done what he did myself to my own dog. <laughs> because we knew what a breath was like. <laughs> I didn't let her die. She fucking stinks. <laughs> Moving away from doggy snogging, meet Bob. He has a very unusual hobby. My name is Bob Gibbons. I'm 60 years of age, and I've got the world's biggest collection of love dolls. 200 plus. 200 love dolls! How creepy is that? Do you reckon he put them on his census form? <laughs> Who lives here? Well, I got Dirty Sue, Busty Brenda, Filthy Maureen and my wife. <laughs> With her talking and her breathing. You're probably thinking he keeps them locked away in a shed. Oh, no. We have them around the house, in the house, in the bedroom. We have them in the front rooms. It's like some kind of budget Playboy mansion. <laughs> I bet that's the only house in the world where Jehovah's Witnesses go, nah, <laughs> we'll come back later. <laughs> Sit, oh, Christ, I've only just seen them bastards. <laughs> Bizarrely, his relationship isn't sexual. OK. Let's take you on a shopping trip. Maybe we'll buy something. That's right, he's taking a sex doll to Tesco. <laughs> Hey, I've got you something really nice. <laughs> Is it a drawing pin? So I can end my misery! <laughs> the strangest part of this story, look how much he spent on his hobby. Probably within 60, 70, 80,000 pounds on actual dolls. 80 grand! If you like plastic women with dead eyes, he should just go on this. <laughs> Thank you.
Time for the good news story. Oh, this is a movie report about Harvey Phillips, who lost three limbs to meningitis as a baby, and he's finally taken his first steps. Diagnosed with meningitis as a baby, Harvey Phillips had both legs and part of his arms amputated to save his life. Ever since, six-year-old Harvey has spent his life trying to be just like his friends. Fitted for the first time with fully moving mechanical legs, he's setting out on a long road to learn how to walk, with the help of specialists at the Northern General Hospital in Sheffield. And with his usual determination, he says he can do it in a week. It's Harvey, um, if he wants it, he'll do it basically. So, and it's, well, it's impressive as well. It's all been Harvey wanting um, bend your legs, as he's called it. So we've just gone along and said, obviously, He's seen other kids with bendy legs, he wants them, and it's just Harvey who's pushed and pushed. Did you ever envisage you'd have a no. like this seen in war? Not at all. Um... Next on his list, perfecting his moves so he can play his favourite sport, football. That's what he wants to do in the long run, and uh, with, with his new legs as well, it just brings him up to the same height as all the other kids at school, which is a big bonus for Harvey as well. So it's looking good. There you are. What a lovely little fella. Hope you enjoyed it. Saturday night, which means it's time for my stand-up guest. Oh, you're going to love this book. He's fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the wonderful Tony Law! <laughs> All right! Yeah! 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 Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, just in case you're wondering, I am wearing a special suit made of Kevlar. Don't know if you've noticed. Uh, it was designed for me by a team of scientists. Yeah, yeah, they designed it for me. Well, what this suit does is it, it soaks up any negative thoughts you might be having <laughs> and shoots them down my left leg where they'll end up in Liverpool at 2 a.m. and violence will ensue. <laughs> so don't be there then. Tricky to get there in that time. But anyways, yeah, but you know, when the team of scientists first approached me to wear the suit, I won't lie to you, I was pretty excited. I thought, finally, clothes won't get in the way of my art. <laughs> now, what if I wore a shirt? Like, oh, I'd love to listen to Tony's art, but I can't get past that cowboy shirt choice. Now, what if I wore jeans that were too tight and I bent over too quickly and made you feel a bit sick? <laughs> no, I wouldn't have wanted that. I wanted something neutral. You know, something that didn't draw any attention to itself. <laughs> and I think it's worked out pretty good with the suit. It's actually called a unitard. Yeah. Yeah, it's got my two favorite words all in one there. Yeah. Okay. Gok one! 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 He's not gonna just say Gok Wan over and over again, is he? Gok Wan! Gok Wan! Gok Wan! Gok Wan! Gok Gok Wan! Gok Wan! Gok Wan! No, Gok! You lost! <laughs> you see? I, uh... Yeah, I, I used to play badminton with Gok Wan in the late 90s. That's how he lost all the weight. You're welcome, ladies. <laughs> brand new bit. I uh, wrote that on the way here. Yeah, yeah, I took the tube and uh, I slept most of the way, so I didn't have a lot of time to spend on it. Basically, it just said Gok Wan. See what happens. <laughs> and there we have it. Actually, you know what? Uh, you know, you know, after, after people have seen me do stand-up comedy, usually the first thing they say to me is, Tony, you don't know how to do it right. But the second thing... <laughs> they often say to me is, Tony, have you got any ideas of what else you'd like to do? And I always say, there's the money shot. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's right. 
Now, uh, you know, I don't care because uh, I've written a motion picture film and uh, it's already been picked up in Hollywood. This is actually my uh, last ever gig, so you're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, I thought it was in the diary. I thought I'll do it. Um, so I'm just gonna read you a bit from my movie. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty mainstream stuff, but I think, I think it's gonna go down pretty great. Just do a little clip from it. Okay, okay, here we go. It's pretty powerful, so, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's powerful stuff. Okay. <laughs> Who are you? Wrong question. You should be asking. Why am I? <laughs> All right, then. Why am I? No, no, you're supposed to ask, why am I? You guys just, why are you? Oh, right, sorry, sorry, got confused. <laughs> you sure this is written down? Yeah, yeah, no, this is how the script's supposed to go. What, even all this conversation right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's all in it. You know what threw me out? What, what? Our voices are exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, I found that a problem, but you know, that's how they cast it. Yeah, okay, let's get started, okay. Who are you? Wrong question. You should be asking, when am I? <laughs> Sorry, fucked up. No, it's just, you know, because you made the mistake. Yeah, that can happen. Feels like they're trying to pad this film out with a lot of dialogue. <laughs> well, there should be some action. Yeah, you're right about that. Actually, you know what it feels like more to me? What's that? It feels like Tony's doing an improvised bit that has no real ending or way out of. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely the pit. He was just hoping for a big laugh to pull out of it. Well, he had it about 12 seconds ago and he's missed it. There's a good one. He should have got out on that one. Oh, that was a big one. Pull out of the pit. Pull out of the pit. No way, there's more in him. You're standing up there pulling the handle on the slot machine. You just want to get more. You should have pulled it out of the pit. Look, and I told you. What? No, you're talking. There's no more laughs. There's one. No, it's gone. It's back. Uh, now it's only at the back. They're laughing a bit. Down in the front, nothing. <laughs> pull out of the bit, pull out of the bit. Yeah, I gotta pull out of the bit now. <laughs> but boy, what a day I've been having today. All right, clearly that's a lie. <laughs> but it was shown to me once. And what's wrong with that as a way of getting into your next bit of stand-up comedy? <laughs> it was true to me. So let's all use the power of our imaginations and travel back through time and space to the day when this was true and significant enough for me to remember it, to tell it back to you, strangers in a room. It was nine months ago. Tony, that's too far back. Try harder. In a place called North London. We can't imagine such a place. And it was a hot day. You remember it? It was the day we called summer. And I'm pushing my pram along to get on a bus, right? I'm pushing my pram along to get on a bus. I wasn't doing all the footwork. Just pushing my pram along. And oh, okay, this seems a bit big for a pram, doesn't it? But I am holding a microphone. Come on. Actually, you don't know, do you? From the information I've given you, maybe I, maybe I need a pram this big. Maybe I've got a weird giant baby in it. In fact, if you've got a baby that big, you don't need to put the word weird in that sentence, do you? That's a given. People just go, oh, God, look at that baby. It feels sick. It's so big. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Why did you add that in? Actually, you don't know, do you? Maybe it's my pram. Maybe it's a man pram. <laughs> I'm sick of turning up places with nowhere to sit. <laughs> hey, Tony, welcome to the barbecue. We're all just sitting on the grass chilling out. Yeah, not me. I'm getting into my man pram. <laughs> ah. You want some chicken? Who take some of your tiny chicken? Ah, way up in my, oh, it's tiny like a pigeon. I'm a giant. Tony, you're only sitting far away. You haven't become bigger. You be quiet with your perspective. There's a normal sized pram. And there's two twins in there. Fuck off. One set of twins. Two. Oh, language, you beast. There's one, one set of twins in there, and they've They've both gone to sleep at the same time. Now, anybody knows anything about one baby going to sleep, it's always, ah, but two of the little treasures. <laughs> it's a miracle, especially on my watch. I think the heat was working in my favor that day. So there I was with two dehydrated, passed out, <laughs> one and a half year old twins. And I'm tired and I'm hot and I'm pushing along the bus, 
pushed her on the bus, and I got a bit of speed going, bumped into someone. Total accident, right? Total accident. But because of the part of the world I was in, I expected it to go one way. I bumped into him, and I thought I'd be like, oh, God, sorry. And they'd be like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's so, you know, cool. It's hot out there. Hey, what do you got there, twins? They're double trouble. Hey, double trouble. Yeah, boy and a girl, get it all out of the go in one way. Yeah, one go, sorry. Yeah, no, fantastic, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, double trouble. It's hot. Yeah, yeah. Have my seat. Something like that. That's how I imagine it <laughs> to go, right? But no, it didn't go down that way at all. I bumped into them, and they used on me what I think is the greatest put-down in all of language. You can't come back to it. It's perfect. I bumped in them, they just turned to me and they just went <laughs> Only they did it correctly. You know the one! <laughs> I hate that one. Because you can't come back to it. You can't come back to it. Because if you're like, you know, because it's just, you're like, oh, fuck off, you dickhead. It was a total accident. Fuck you. <laughs> They've only done a sound. You've done all that swearing. <laughs> oh, what an arrogant prick. I gotta do something, say something. And I thought, no, you can't do anything, Tony. You, you're a mature man now. You've got two children there. You've got to leave it alone. You've got to do nothing in exactly the same way you would have done nothing before you had children due to cowardice. <laughs> Just let it go. It's worked out. And I thought, no, I've got to do something. This is what all my training has been about. 12 years as a stand-up comedian. Doesn't seem like it, but sometimes. <laughs> Dig deep in your toolbox, Tony. You've done those gigs where it's mainly stag and hen -dos. Admittedly, you come off second best every time, but you see now the other comedians do it. You must have learned something. Come on, Tony, dig deep. You opened for strippers before. You were against that ethically, but damn it, you needed the money. Come on, Tony. <laughs> dig deep. You thought you were doing a cruise. It was a ferry. Come on, Tony. <laughs> and then the idea came to me. It was so, like, rarely in life do you ever get an idea that good. It just popped out of my head, just hovered above me, looked down at me and reassured me. It was that good. It just went, hey, Tony. Everything's gonna be A-OK. -okay. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. I'm the best idea you've ever had. It's gonna go very well for you. Everyone on this bus is gonna stand up and cheer you off the bus. There's gonna be a standing ovation. There'll be a parade for you when you get off. Wrong music. Shut up, there was no time to book it. You wouldn't be on an elephant otherwise. Good point, I'll stop my whining. And then the idea just popped back into my head. And I was so filled with confidence. I thought, wow, you fucked with the wrong guy today. Wow, because I've just invented a new cultural put down that's gonna be used throughout the ages. And it's happening to you right now. And then I had to make eye contact with him. Which is hard to do, because he was very, very arrogant indeed. <laughs> I don't want you to miss a thing, because this is happening right now. And then I forgot the idea. <laughs> as easily as it had come to me, it had gone. And I thought, oh, think of something. Do anything, Tony. Do anything. You've got his eye contact. Do let him get away with it. And then I looked down. My son was looking up at me with doughy eyes. We've done some baking that day. <laughs> I'm gonna deliver it. I don't know. There's nothing. I've got nothing. Just back out of it. Back out of it. Just back out of it. Back out. No, no. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Everyone on the bus was embarrassed. They were moving upstairs. <laughs> Even he was moving upstairs. I thought if I did it longer. I tried to jazz it up a bit. <laughs> we got bogeys, 12 o'clock, here comes Jerry. <laughs> He's fashion, pushing, fashion, Dax on, Dax on. <laughs> Bomber command, bomber command, this is your upper middle class pilot speaking. <laughs> That's the only way I can fly this plane in this day and age. What with the class system and all? <laughs> He's fucking right. I'm the rear gunner. I'm five foot two and I'm malnourished. I'm the only one who can fit in this tiny fucking compartment. <laughs> Boy, we're getting a lovely cross section of the war effort here. <laughs> yeah, I'm the fucking bomb aimer and normally I can do this accent better, but I'm all bent over and my throat's all jammed up. <laughs> I've been hit, I've been hit. Everyone around me has been incinerated and they've all died, which is lucky. Now the narrative is much easier to follow. It's one character. <laughs> oh, I'm parachuting over northern France. 
I hope I land safely in that farmer's field and he's connected somewhat to the uh, French resistance. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's safely. Tuk, 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 tuk. Hello, uh, I'm with the French resistance. <laughs> this is my farm, that's lucky for you. Yes, I'd say so. Uh, maybe you'd like some cake in the morning? Why not? It's okay. Yes, it's a bit random, but okay. <laughs> yes, that accent's really terrible. Well, I have to think they're all bad. No, no, you weren't there. <laughs> so then I got off the bus. <laughs> and, uh, Yeah, that's some sort of record for the longest get off the bus joke. <laughs> You've been very kind. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Law.